Everybody in fellowship? All right. That's good. Well, I think most of you know we, we uh, did have a, a rocking uh, memorial for Tom Hardwick yesterday. And uh, one of my old friends, compadres, uh, that uh, was also a friend of Tom's uh, for several years, drove all the way here from Florida. What kind of a nut could, would do that? <laughs> but anyway, it's Ron Snyder. Uh, he's the pastor of Sarasota, Florida. And uh, give him the opportunity to come up here and say a few words. If you would, please. Well, I figured it was time for your five-year checkup. <clears throat> hey, this is nice. <laughs> May want to do this at home. Uh, good to see all of y'all again. Uh, the Ron Snyder and the 12 disciples send their greetings from Florida. Uh, we've got uh, Mary Wolf specifically said to say hi to everybody. The Wolf family wanted to, and Pete said to say hello to everybody, uh, that he misses y'all. Uh, as you know, may have known, probably Greg's probably kept you up to date with what's going on, but we got thrown out of our facilities here about, uh, uh, what was it, uh, was November or December somewhere. And uh, one of our ladies, uh, Eileen, took it upon herself. We were all looking for a place to meet, but she found a place. And uh, we got a uh, fine black couple that was uh, running a sort of a rehab for disabled people and things like that and so they said well if you want to use it you can use it and I said well okay how much are you, do you need for rent they said we're not gonna charge anything so we got free rent now uh, and uh, a place to work uh, or at least to meet and we uh, had the way they had their set up because they're working with disabled people uh, security wise when you come in the door locks and you, so people just can't walk in in the middle of class and shock you or anything. We've had that happen before. Uh, but things are going pretty well down there. We just had a new guy show up, uh, pray for that, uh, because he showed up and said, oh, I, I think I want to get trained for the ministry. And I thought, what is wrong with me? Why does God hate me? <laughs> But we've got uh, a Greek and Hebrew teacher lined up and uh, uh, systematic at any rate, so we'll still figure out the rest of it. But uh, we're uh, cranking right along down there. Uh, just started, uh, finished up the book of, uh, actually I finished up Ephesians about the same time Greg did or a little before. And then we went on to Philippians uh, and now getting ready to start Philemon, uh, which is only one chapter, so that won't take too terribly long. But uh, things seem to be going pretty well down there. It's, uh, it's a job. Uh, we pray for you guys all the time. We appreciate you and uh, the support we've had over the years. And uh, uh, again, it seems like uh, the only time I'm up here is a tragedy or an ordination. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and that's obviously not a tragedy. I'm, I'm glad Tom's, I know everybody is, that Tom's at rest. He's at home with the Lord, and we're all happy about that. Just miss him. Uh, quite a lot, but other than that, you know, we'll survive. Uh, but uh, don't really have a whole lot of new news. Uh, Greg did give me a, a new route to get up here. Was uh, a little, He said, well, you know, this goes kind of cuts off some of the main roads. And the first time we went over a cattle guard, I thought, <laughs> <laughs> and the roads stopped being paved after a point. And we saw that, you know, the deliverance kid with the banjo. I saw him somewhere in the middle of North Texas, it looked like. So, uh, no, but he gave us a, a route that was a little, it, it wasn't that bad, but it was, uh, it, it was faster though, strangely enough. So we did appreciate that. And of course we appreciate Greg and Marcia and the work they do, uh, obviously uh, the deacons here, uh, all, all of you, in fact, we, we love you and miss you and uh, ho hope we hang in there till the rapture and uh, boy, it can't be soon enough, can it? <laughs> That's about it. Thank you, Ron. Well, as we uh, continue 
uh, here this afternoon. I'll try and have uh, an abbreviated second session. Uh, we're doing the Lord's Table today. And uh, we've only got so much notes with us anyway. Well, <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 8. And here Zechariah says, I saw at night, and behold, a man was riding on a red horse, and he was standing among the myrtle trees which were in the ravine with red, sorrel, and white horses behind him. The Hebrew here, uh, you find in parentheses there, just uh, strictly for pronunciation, uh, not uh, literal transliteration, but we begin with uh, Ra'athi, the cow perfect first person singular of the verb Ra'ah, standard Hebrew verb for to look or see. And it's translated here, I saw. And that's followed by Halela. We have the ha article here translated as the plus Halela. The masculine singular noun, literally the night. So he says, I saw at night. That's followed by Wehene Ish, which is the uh, wow conjunction here. Uh, could be translated as but now, and it's translated here as and. And it's followed by the interjection, Hene, which uh, often is translated as lo or behold. So we have uh, that plus the Masculine singular noun, ish, a man, and behold, a man. This is followed by rokeb, the cow masculine singular participle of the verb rakab, to mount or ride. And of course, he was riding. A man was riding. <clears throat> That's followed by uh, alsus, which is uh, the preposition al, which means upon or on, uh, followed by the a uh, noun, Seuss here, a horse. Uh, so he's uh, on a horse. That's followed by a dome, the masculine singular adjective, red or a red one. So we have a red horse. And here that's followed by the way who, the uh, conjunction while here, uh, translated as and. And then we have the uh, third person masculine singular pronoun, who, he, and here uh, it's translated and he followed by uh, omed, the cow masculine singular participle of the verb amad, to stand. It says, and he was standing, and we have the uh, preposition here, uh, functioning as a, a locative in a sense, a bane. It can be translated as between, but it says standing among. And we have ha ha hadasim. Uh, we have the uh, hey article here. Translated the, and then we have hadasim, the masculine plural of the noun hadas, which means a myrtle. So we have the uh, myrtles or the myrtle trees. And that's followed by esher, the relative pronoun, that or which. <clears throat> the myrtle trees which. That's followed by uh, Sula. And we have uh, the uh, base preposition in plus how the article translated as the. Uh, Metsula, the feminine singular noun, a deep basin or ravine or in the ravine. And that's followed by we akare we which is uh, the wow conjunction here, uh, translated and, plus a car, which is the preposition, which is after or behind. Here as behind, uh, we have what the third person masculine singular suffix, uh, basically uh, translated as his or him. So and behind him, susim. We have the masculine pearl of the noun Horses. So that's uh, followed by edamim, which is the masculine plural adjective red or red ones. And that's followed by serakim, the masculine plural adjective for uh, translate here as sorrel, uh, kind of chestnut color, if you will, the sorrel ones. 
And then we have Wule Banim, which is uh, the wow conjunction and the masculine plural adjective of Laban, which is uh, translated here as white or white ones. So that's what we have in uh, Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 8. Zechariah 1, 8. I saw at night, and behold, a man was riding on a red horse, and he was standing among the myrtle trees which were in the ravine with red, sorrel, and white horses behind him. So Zechariah narrates what he's seeing here. Uh, we have the exposition, point one, and verse seven. Verse seven constitutes a secondary introduction with very precise chronological information leading up to verse eight, which clearly features Zechariah's perception of what seems to be some kind of prophetic message. Point two, about three months after the call to repentance, Zechariah saw what many Bible scholars believe to be dreams or visions. Now, uh, this has happened. We've got evidence in the Old Testament. This is not the first time that anything like this happened. We saw some things in other parts of the Bible. We go to Genesis chapter 20 and verse 3. And we see here that it says, But God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is married. And of course, uh, we understand there that, uh, you know, we have the issue with uh, certain husbands in the Old Testament that wanted to claim their wife was their sister because they were afraid they would be killed if they knew it was his wife. This happened to Abraham and Isaac. Let's look at Isaiah 29, 7. Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 7. And here are the words of the Lord by Isaiah and the multitude of all nations who wage war against Ariel, even all who wage war against her and her stronghold and who distress her will be like a dream. A vision of the night. And that's what Zechariah is having, a vision at night. Point three, his opening clause, Rehithi Halilah, translated, I saw at night, expressed a first person account of Zechariah's perception of exactly what appeared to him at night in rich and colorful detail. Point four, the Hebrew language used in this verse does not communicate the notion that Zechariah was asleep or that he had some kind of dream. It was a vision. That's one of the things when you think about seeing things at night, well, unless you're by a well-lit area, you don't see all these colorful things. We see here in the, the account that Zechariah is standing in a particular area by what he recognizes as myrtle trees in a ravine, and he has these horses behind him, these colorful horses. So this is something that's very vivid to Zechariah. Point five, Zechariah's first vision includes at least six things. A, a colorful description of the things that appeared to him. B, verbal intercession by the angel of the Lord. C, communications with the horseman or horse rider. An explanation concerning the things that he saw. Communications with the Lord of hosts. And of course, commands to proclaim a declaration of encouragement from the Lord. Point six, in several of the Old Testament and some New Testament accounts, it's not unusual for the Lord's key people to have a revelation experiences much like Zechariah. 
Let's look back at 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 12. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 12. And I think this is the second time that the Lord appeared to Solomon. It says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. <laughs> Let's also look at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 2. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heavens were stirring up the great sea. Let's go to Acts in the New Testament, chapter 16 and verse 9. Some New Testament accounts of what's going on here, Acts chapter 16 and verse 9. Here it says, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And of course, we look at uh, Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And we have the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw, all that he saw. And of course, verses 12 through 16 of chapter one. And here John says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Very, very vivid appearance that John had. A vision that appeared to him. Point seven, forms of the Hebrew verb ra'ah to see used, are used 1,323 times in the Old Testament Hebrew text to express sight perception, going all the way back to the historical creation restoration accounts in the book of Genesis. And of course, we know that uh, they're used to uh, communicate certain particular things that we can relate with, uh, you know, when we're talking about God. And what he did, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 10. Now we see here that God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And it says, and God saw that it was good. I think we can relate to that. You see something, you think it's good? Yeah. Verse 31, God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening. And there was morning, the sixth day. And we talk about uh, human perception, sight perception. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. This is all the favorite verse of the men. When the women saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her. And he ate. Yeah, all the guys, they want to blame it on the woman every time. It was the woman, right? Well, that just doesn't work. 
But she saw. She was uh, deceived, and she saw certain things. Zechariah saw certain things. Point eight, according to several biblical resources, the verb ra is of special importance and used more than any other word for the means by which an Old Testament prophet receives divine revelation from God. We'll look at Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. And here it says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. And we look at Jeremiah chapter 1. <clears throat> verses 11 through 13. Jeremiah chapter 1. Verses 11 through 13. Now here Jeremiah says, The word of the Lord came to me saying, What do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. He says, The word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Well, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 1. I think you get the idea that uh, these prophets uh, saw many things. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 1. Now it came about in the 30th year on the fifth day of the fourth month while I was by the river Kabar among the exiles. The heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Visions of God. God's the source of these things. The Lord God. Point nine by, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the Old Testament clearly communicates that basic forms of divine revelation being sent by God to a believer, a man or a prophet, can be perceived or received in more than one way. More than one way. Going back to the uh, Genesis account, chapter 31, verses 10 and 11. Genesis chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. And it came about at the time when the flock were mating that I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream. And behold, the male goats which were mating were striped, speckled, and spotted. Then the angel of the Lord said to me in the dream, Jacob. And I said, here I am. So you can see here that this came to Jacob in a dream if you will. The funny thing about it is, it's while the flocks are mating. That's something we don't normally see, but it's often uh, something that happens when you have livestock. But there was a little thing going on at that particular time between uh, him and Laban. Let's also look at Numbers chapter 12, verses 5 and 6. Numbers 12, chapter 5 and 6. Numbers 12, verses 5 and 6. Here then the Lord came down on a pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent, and he called Aaron and Miriam. When they had both come forward, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. He said, I shall speak with him in a dream. Obviously, uh, two different forms here of the Lord making himself known. Let's look at Job chapter 33. Job chapter 33, verses 14 through 18.
And here we have the wisdom of Job. He says, indeed, God speaks once. This is actually uh, Elihu. But he says, indeed, God speaks once or twice, yet no one notices it. He says, in a dream, a vision of the night, when sound sleep falls on men while they slumber in their beds. Then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction that he may turn aside from his conduct and keep man from pride. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from passing over into Sheol. And also Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. And here Daniel's receiving instructions, and he's recorded this, the vision of the evenings and mornings, which has been told is true. But keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up again and carried on the king's business. But I was astounded at the vision, and there was none to explain it. So you can see that uh, in some cases, that these uh, forms of divine revelation, they took the physical toll on these prophets. And of course, uh, this is something that uh, God has designed a way to reveal himself to mankind. <clears throat> Point 10, in the very late evening hours of the 24th day of Shabbat, at night, Zechariah saw what may have been a fairly common sight during the time of his ministry in, around, or near Judah, or the city of of Jerusalem. We look at Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 12. Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 12 here. It says, Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no compassion for Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, with which you have been indignant these 70 years? So this is communications from the Lord here to Zechariah concerning Judah and these certain cities. And of course, we know that Jerusalem is the home of the temple. Also, verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion. My house will be built in it declares the Lord of hosts, and a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. So these things concern these particular geographical areas. We're going to see that as we move along through these visions that Zechariah had. Point 11, the date does not seem to have any ceremonial significance. However, the vision occurred during the normal time of the year when the Lord sends heavy rains to Israel. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 26. And verse 4. Now, you know, we were kind of under a drought for quite a long time. And guess what? Here recently, God has sent some nice heavy rains. And I sure appreciated it. After... Uh, having the knee surgery and trying to recover. I didn't want to be outside dragging a hose and a sprinkler around or doing anything like that. You know, and I prayed and said, God, I can't do this and you know it. So, uh, you know, give me some time. Spare me for a little while. I feel like he answered my prayers. But here in Leviticus, talking about uh, the people obeying God, he says, then I shall give you rains in their season so that the land will yield its produce and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Now you may say, well, why did you point out these? We know God gives the rain. Well, if you remember in our study of Haggai, 
which overlaps with Zechariah, God called a drought on the whole land. He called a drought on everything. We have no evidence at this particular point in time other than his word that he gave to the people, which he said he would bless them. But they've got to return to him. So, even though we have here, uh, we talk about this particular word that says to strike, and of course some people say that's related to the heavy rains that occurred during that season. Well, I don't see anything in the, in the context that says anything like that. But it is normally the time of year when the Lord sends heavy rains to Israel. There are certain periods of time, just like he does here, that he, he sends these rains. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 24. And here Jeremiah says, They do not say in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God, who gives rain in its season, both the autumn rain and the spring rain, who keeps for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Well, some sources, they claim that uh, you know, the, the rains come on, on our calendar for Israel, and they, they may begin in October and, and last as far as into May. So when we talk about this, this being this particular time of year, uh, the month of Shabbat, uh, the uh, time frame there being about 15th of February, it should be during the rainy season. Point 12, the temporal phrase, Halalah, translated at night, expressed a time that occurred after sunset when darkness overtook the light of day that was created by God. See, God set all this in order. And that's one of the things about the faithfulness of God. We have day and we have night, and it just continues on, continues on. Something that he set in order back in the uh, creation restoration passage. Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning on day one. You see? Same word here in the Hebrew uh, for night. We have uh, Layla. Let's also look at Psalm 74, verses 16 and 17. <laughs> Psalm 74, verses 16 and 17. And here it says, Yours is the day, yours also is the night. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have established all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. So these things that we see, the seasons, the day and night cycle that continually goes on, God's established all this and he carries it on. And when Zechariah saw these visions in full color, it was at night. Point 13, to draw attention to what he saw, Zechariah used the phrase, Weheneish, translated in, Behold a man, which does not seem to be anything extraordinary, does it? Behold a man. Well, oftentimes in the night you can look and you might see a man somewhere. But here, he has a colorful description of what went on. Point 14, the Hebrew noun, Ish, translated as a man, denotes the general concept of a man as an individual male human being in contrast to a woman, which is Isha. We've all heard the term. Of course, you've heard the Greek term, gune. And of course, all the women says, well, I'd rather be referred to as Isha, right? Yeah. Well, it just makes sense. It seems to be a, a much more uh, beautiful name, if you will, in the Hebrew. Genesis uh, chapter 2, verses 22 and 23 And here in this account, the Lord God fashioned into a woman. And we have here a woman, Isha, 
the rib which he had taken from the man. And of course, we know that man is Adam or Adam. And he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. You can see that uh, we have the DNA, basically, of man. And God, of course, manufactured a woman from the bone that he took out of man. So we have a man in contrast to a woman in this particular account. He saw a man, not a woman. Point 15 in Zechariah's account, the horseman's name is not provided. However, the man was seen on a horse of a particular color described as Adom, which means red. Anybody ever seen a red horse? Well, we could all say, yeah, well, I've seen a horse kind of looks red. Well, they're not red like some of you are wearing on your shirts and blouses, if you will. Not that color of red. But obviously it's, it's red enough that Zechariah can make that out about this particular animal. The Hebrew noun Seuss translated as horse is a standard term used of four-legged equestrian animals that were commonly traded and they were often used for transportation or military purposes. Let's look back at Genesis chapter 47. Genesis 47 and verse 17. Now, of course, we have uh, Joseph in Egypt here during the famine. It says, so the people, they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses and the flocks and the herds and the donkeys, and he fed them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year, that particular year of the famine. He was a uh, shrewd man, if you will. Let's look at Exodus chapter 15. Exodus 15 and verse 19. Exodus 15 and 19. And I think we all know the story about Pharaoh and his army. And it says, For the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea. And the Lord brought back the waters of the sea on them. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea. So we see here that uh, we have a horseman, a guy who's capable of mounting and riding a horse. <clears throat> Point 17, however, the man that Zechariah saw, he was mounted and riding on a red horse which reminds uh, educated Bible students who are in the know about a similar New Testament passage in the book of Revelation. And of course, we're talking about Revelation chapter 6 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 4. And here John's words, he said, and another, a red horse went out and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth and that men would slay one another and a great sword was given to him. No sword mentioned here. Point 18, can the man riding on a red horse be symbolic of something Related to Zechariah's first message, the messages of Haggai, or the book of Revelation. There's your cliffhanger. We'll carry on with this verse Wednesday night. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. We pray that you continue to bless us, and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.